Hey everybody, it's Brick Waffle here with a new series on Hearts of Iron 4. This is going to be a tutorial series really aimed at players who are new to the game, looking for some advice on getting started. So for this series, I'll be covering a lot of topics, but not everything. And I'm assuming you're going to be playing with all of the DLCs as of the date of this video. And at this point, By Blood Alone is our latest. We will be using some mods for this, for performance and for quality of life changes. That full list is in the description, and I'll highlight each of them as we see them. Now, a couple things to note, this series is not for Iron Man games and is not for competitive multiplayer. We're not going to be deep diving into specific numbers, best templates, anything like that. This is really advice for friendly multiplayer games, so you have some clue about what's going on when your friends pull you into playing with them. As with all Paradox games, there's a lot to learn, and sometimes you will lose spectacularly, but as long as you learn from that loss, you're doing it right. So to get started, we're going to go to the multiplayer menu. And from here, make sure you can click up in the top left corner to change your name. By default, that's going to be player. If you like that name, great. If everybody goes in with the name player, that might be a little bit confusing. And when you want to join a game, most often you'll have the server host share a server ID with you. You can click connect to server ID, put in that number and that password, if anything, and then click join. Now instead, I'm going to be hosting a game and I can give the game a name. By default, it will name it as your player name. I can give this a password, tags, or description, and I can make this public, private, or friends only. So when you're first in the multiplayer lobby, you'll see that this screen that shows where all the players are connected and gives you a small chat window might be in the way. If you want to hide that while you're looking around, you can click the lobby section in the bottom left, and that gives you a lot more screen real estate to see what's happening. Now if you're playing cooperatively with the other friends that are also playing their own countries, you probably are going to want to pick countries that work well together. So countries that are historically at war may be difficult to play together because that's going to mean one of you is going to have to go in a different direction than history. And as we'll see as we get into the series, the focus trees for each country really kind of help determine which way you can go along those paths. So think about your country's ideology, the focuses that you might have available, and who would make good partners. Now, another thing that new players tend to do is pick big complex countries like Germany or Russia without really understanding all of the systems. In theory, those countries are usually easier to win with because they have more resources, but it does require you to know how to use those resources well. For the most part, you're better off picking a smaller country until you're comfortable with the basics. Maybe somebody who's really not going to be doing a whole lot in the war like Ireland, so you can just learn the interface, learn how to control things, support a major nation who's doing something, and then when you're comfortable with it, pick a bigger nation that you can really dig into. Now for our first few multiplayer games, you're probably going to want to leave historical AI focuses enabled. What that's going to do is it's going to have the computer try its best to follow the actual chain of historical events. Of course, as soon as players are involved and they start doing things that didn't happen in World War II, then things are going to change, and the AI is going to have to adapt to that anyway. But it does mean you're not going to get weird things like, you know, Italy joining the Allies or things like that. Barring a few very rare exceptions. Once you get the basics and you know what countries are likely to do, then you can turn that off and you can start to play with alternate history scenarios, and that can breathe some new life into the game for players who've spent a lot of time in it. Now in terms of your options, cooperative allows multiple players to play the same country. That doesn't just start you off an alliance or anything like that, but it would, for example, let two players play the UK or three players, and that could let new players learn one system without having to manage the whole country. So if you've got somebody who really wants to learn how navies work, obviously the UK has a great navy in the starting scenario, and that gives them something to work with right off the bat, rather than a smaller country that may only have a handful of ships that get destroyed in their first engagement. Over time, that could even let more experienced players really dive into the nuances of ship and tank design or some of the other topics we're going to just briefly touch on later on and let somebody else handle the majority of what's going on in the world. Now hot join is going to be pretty useful if you've got players that can't make it to every session and you have a game that lasts for more than one evening of play. Hot join allows somebody to jump into the middle of the game and pick a nation that they want to control. Now that can be the same country that they were playing earlier. Or if somebody gets defeated early on and completely wiped out of the game, they can leave, hot join back in, and pick a new country and keep playing. So that's really helpful if you've got multiple players and you're kind of having people jump in and out. Custom game rules you can use to tweak the starting conditions. This allows you to strengthen certain nations or change the way that most of our rules work. For this tutorial series, we're not going to touch any of these options. We're going to leave them alone. But as you get into this, you can start to, again, get into alternate history and a lot of what-if scenarios. 
now that we have the game up and running, we're going to spend a lot of time kind of looking through this interface and explaining what a lot of these options are before we ever unpause the game. Like with every Paradox game, there's a ton of information to be had, mostly by mousing over various areas and reading the tooltips. So for the most part, that means that even if you don't know what everything is, you can kind of look at stuff and see, in general, if a tooltip is green, it's good, and if it's red, it's bad. So up here we can see that the effects from our current war support, for example, are mostly good, and a few things are bad. As we get into each piece, we'll try to explain what some of these things do, but as you start to get beyond the scope of this tutorial series, start really looking into those tooltips and, and digging into what's happening on your screen. And one of the things you'll notice right off the bat is that your screen will look different from mine unless you're using the same mods that I am. The first one you're seeing here is the FPS map. It strips down a lot of the detail of the map and keeps it to, to something that will run a little bit better on most computers. And unusually for a multiplayer game, the way that your client side map looks can also affect the speed that the game runs in a multiplayer session. So that's just a little quirk of the Paradox game. And one of the things that you'll see is that sometimes players that don't have really beefy computers might fall a little bit behind on time and desynchronize and that can really slow your game down or even make it impossible to play. A couple of things that are the legacy of Hearts of Iron 4 being around for a while is you cannot use WASD to move, you have to use the arrow keys and there's no key bindings to remap that. So you will find yourself occasionally hitting buttons like this and bringing up menus because you're trying to use WASD out of habit and that's just something that you're going to have to get used to. Now, one of the other things that we'll see is that there are multiple map modes here. So there's these default ones, as you can see on this side. And we're also using a mod that adds a ton more map modes. We're going to start with just the default map mode, which is how the game is normally going to start up for you. This is also the army strategic map mode, and this is where you're going to spend most of your time. This is going to show you all the national boundaries that you would expect. You can see the political borders, you can see country colors, all that kind of thing. And you can zoom in. You can see these different states and even different provinces within the state. And that we're going to talk about what all that means here in just a minute. Now the state overview screen here will show you who owns the state, any foreign claims if anybody has one, and then you can also see what things are built there and what things you can build. So in this case we have four levels of infrastructure here and we can go to five, two air bases we can go to ten, so on and so forth. There's also 25 potential slots in the state for building although currently we only have eight slots available. The rest of these are going to be unlocked by decisions, by focuses, by all sorts of things as we go through, including technology. Now the state overview will also show you how to use nuclear weapons if you had any, but that's going to be a topic for something a little bit more advanced. We're going to talk about that quite a bit later. The strategic navy and strategic air map modes are going to work very similarly, so when we click strategic navy, you can see that instead of country, you can still see some of those colors in the background, but you can see now we have regions like the Alpine region, or the Western Balkans, or the Tyrrhenian Sea, or the Western Mediterranean Sea. The air and navy modes both use these same region ideas because ships and aircraft will operate in much larger areas than armies do. They cover a much wider base of operations for their, for their units. This is going to allow you to move your task forces between regions. They're in navy or in air, and you'll see here it just keeps those same names, but kind of grays out all the colors in the background. The operatives map mode looks just like the main regular default map mode, or army strategic mode, except that this is only going to show you spies and not armies. We'll come back to operatives and intelligence in a later tutorial as well. Some of the other map modes let you focus on supplies, or terrain, or resistance to your occupation, compliance of your subjugated territories, resources that you might have available, your infrastructure, and factions. And this is going to show you who's in which factions. That can also be very helpful to see how is the Axis doing versus the Allies, how is Comintern doing versus non-aligned countries, and so on. You can click your country flag in the upper left corner of the screen to see summary details about your country. In the top section you can see your leader, which national focus you're currently pursuing, more about that soon, and any national spirits that might be modifying your country. These can be good or bad, and they'll change over time based on events and decisions that you make along the way. You can mouse over each of them to get a sense of what your country is good at or bad at as you start the game. If you're a member of a faction, such as the Access Allies or Common Turn, you'll see that here as well. And below that, you can see your country's ruling party and when the next election will occur, if ever. 
To the right, you can see a pie chart representing how much of your population supports each political ideology. This is very important because your choices, and sometimes the choices of your enemies, can trigger a civil war if one ideology that's not in power wants to change that. In that case, your country will fracture into at least two pieces. Spain could be a whole video on its own. And you'll control the one you started as if the civil war was forced on you, or as the rebels if you instigated it yourself through national focuses. The proportion of troops, supplies, territory, and so on that you control will be directly proportional to the percentage of the population that supports your ideology in that case. We're going to skip occupied territories, collaboration, and managed subjects for now and come back to those in future videos. For now, just know that those allow you to merge or break up your country in interesting ways. The Laws and Government section will let you set laws to determine your conscription, trade, and economic policies, as well as pick advisors to the, provide some passive modifiers to your country. All of these require political power to choose, and we'll talk about how you generate that shortly. Now, your conscription law determines how much of your population is recruitable in your military, as shown by the manpower resource. The more aggressively re you recruit, the more you hurt your economy as you pull workers out of factories and send them into the front lines. Your trade law determines how much of the resources you produce are traded to the rest of the world in exchange for the use of their civilian factories, and how many are kept for your own use. If you find yourself the target of trade embargoes that prevent you from trading for the resources you need, you may need to close your economy to keep the resources that you do produce to fuel your military. Your economy law determines how many civilian factories out of your total number of factories are dedicated to producing consumer goods. This is essentially everything your country makes that is not involved in war, and you can think of it about how much your total economy has switched from making butter to making bullets. In general, the higher percentage of civilian factories, the fewer you have for constructing additional infrastructure or for trading for strategic resources. Political advisors modify your country in a wide variety of ways, but some of the important ones to look for are ones that boost your political power gain, usually called silent workhorse, and ones that modify your ideology, usually called a demagogue or a reformer. That ensures you can stay as a certain political party or help you change to a new one. Many of these are also locked until you complete specific focuses or until certain events occur. The Research and Production section lets you buy some permanent bonuses to your research and production in exchange for political power. This is a great place to spend that power if you're otherwise accumulating it faster than you're spending it. And the Military Staff section allows you to appoint leaders that will give passive bonuses to your Army, Navy, and or Air Force. We'll talk more about these later. When you click Select a National Focus, you'll be presented with your country's focus tree. Your national focus determines what your country is prioritizing at any given time. When you finish a focus, you have 30 days to pick a new one without worrying about pausing. All the accumulated time that's going while you're working through that and picking the next one will be applied to that focus immediately. You can pan and zoom the focus trees with your mouse, and even search for keywords in the upper right corner to highlight focuses that match that search term. Some focuses have requirements. Focuses with a solid line require all the ones above them to be completed first. However, those with dotted lines only require one of the parent focuses to be completed before you can begin. And sometimes focuses will have an exclamation mark. This shows that those focuses are mutually exclusive, and you can only ever pick one or the other. Sometimes this can lock out large portions of your tree permanently, for example, choosing fascism over democracy. Some other focuses will require conditions such as at least X amount of world tension, or even for you to be at war or at peace with specific countries. Often these focuses will be canceled if you don't finish them and those prerequisites change, so be mindful of the requirements of your current focus, as well as any you might want to choose soon. With that in mind, what should you pick? Well, since the focus trees are different per country, at least for majors, it really depends on your current situation. In general, all focus trees allow you to emphasize your army, or your navy, or your air force, infrastructure, or politics. In cooperative multiplayer games, you'll definitely want to coordinate so that your focuses don't start a war that your allies aren't prepared to help you with. You can right-click another country to see details about them similar to your own country overview. You can see their leader, their ideology, and so on, but most of the specifics will be unknown to you unless you are in a faction together or have a good spy network. You can see the country's relationship with yours, their stability, and their war support at the top. And on the left panel, you can see their agreements with other countries. This is very important as a country you might otherwise be able to conquer easily could be guaranteed by a major power 
which means they'll join any wars with the subject of their guarantee. Most of this window is taken up by various interactions that you might attempt. Some will be grayed out because they have prerequisites you don't meet. For example, you, usually, can't declare war without first justifying it to your population. Others will be green but have a red X at the end, and this means the country will not accept your proposal. If the button is green and has a green check mark at the end, the country will accept your proposal. That's important to note, in multiplayer games, you can ignore the red X when sending the request to another player. That just means they wouldn't accept it if they were the AI. Players always choose whether to accept a proposal from another player, as long as you meet the prerequisites. We'll talk more about these various interactions in other parts of the series. But for now, that's where we're going to wrap up our first video. In our next video, we're going to talk about all the summaries and options at the top of the screen and start to get into actually what do all these icons mean.